The Astronomy of the Bhagavat Purana, Part 1 of 3. This is based on the 5th canto, chapters 16 to 26 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, another name for the Bhagavat Purana, based on translations and commentary by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. My explanations are based on the works of Sadaputta Das, Dr. Richard Thompson, and also references from the works of Danavir Goswami. The purpose is to present the fifth canto in an accessible way that can be appreciated by those devoted to the Puranas as well as those familiar with modern astronomy. This is also in tribute to the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, a project being built by the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in West Bengal. And it's also a personal offering to the 50th anniversary of the same movement. I would need to start with quotes supporting the fact that the ancient Vedic priests knew that the earth is a globe. Here's a quote from the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. People living in countries at points diametrically opposite to where the sun is first seen rising will see the sun setting, and if a straight line were drawn from a point where the sun is at midday, the people in countries at the opposite end would be experiencing midnight. This is only possible if the earth is circular. From the great epic Mahabharata describes the earth as pari mandale, meaning round land. And in the Jyotish Sastras we find references to bugola, which translates as earth globe. More quotes here by Srila Prabhupada. Just like here in this planet, when you go up you see it is ball. But in this ball there are so many controlling deities here also. How much big the Vraha animal was to pick up the whole earth, earthly planet, just like a ball. And finally, a quote from the third canto of the Bhagavatam purport, All the planets here are described as Gola, round. Every planet is round, just like islands in the great ocean. Yet, within mainstream science, the common perception of the universe is essentially based on observable matter. In contrast, the Vedic scriptures describe a universe teeming with life. But, they are beings with bodies not limited to gross matter that we can actually perceive. These superior beings, the Puranas, see the world around them in quite a different way. For example, they could see a big city in three dimensions, but we would see the same thing but in a more limited way, like in two dimensions in this example. Both views are valid and true in their own way, but the Bhagavad Purana describes the multi-dimensional view of the celestial beings. So that leads us nicely on to chapters 16 and 19, description of Jambudweep. Essentially Jambudweep, a Mount Smeru, is a huge singular island with mountains and in the centre is this cone-like huge structure called Mount Smeru. It includes mountain ranges that surround the Golden Mountain. They mark the perimeters of various heavenly realms which have pious and godlike inhabitants. And to the south there is also Bharat Vash, which often means ancient greater India or sometimes the whole earth itself. This Jambadweep, looking at it from the side, we see it is surrounded by an ocean of salt water. And here's a topological map of Jambadweep, with the black lines showing the mountain ranges, and the blue lines, of course, representing the rivers. More about that later. So where and what is Jambadweep? Sadaputatas explains there are four basic models here. Links between earth and heavenly realms. Those huge heavenly realms the earth plane, and a centre pivot of our solar system. Within this part of the fifth canto there are a number of separate facts and figures represented here by red dots. Each dot here is relevant to two or three of the models. The models cover different views, levels of consciousness and time periods. Now there is some crossing over, where some descriptions are relevant to more than one model. I suggest there are connections between the everyday sense perception and the multidimensional universe, and these models try to show that. First model. Links between places on Earth and heavenly realms. Let us focus first of all on the area of Central Asia, especially where the mountains are. There we go, there are the Central Asian mountains there, including all the kind of surrounding countries. Now. If we did this topologically, with the black lines showing the mountain ranges, the, the main mountain ranges, and of course the blue of the rivers, we can see it's very, very similar to the map of Jambudweep we, we saw earlier. So in one sense, the Central Asian region is Jambudweep. However, let's go into more. 
First of all, let's look at the south region of Jambudweep, and sure enough, we get Bhadravash, or India. It is believed more than 3000 BC, India itself, and of course before, was the centre of a huge worldwide culture and empire. So in one sense, Bhadravash is just India, and in another sense, it represents the whole Earth itself, as the Bhavatam is believed to have been spoken around 3000 BC. The second model, as the heavenly realms, which are huge. The fifth canto, or sorry, the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam describes the Mada does not mean the Mada River in India. The five sacred rivers in India are all celestial. Like the Ganges River, the Mada River also flows in the higher planetary systems. This is a useful quote, as we'll see in a moment. Looking at the sheer scale of the mountains of Jambudweep, as described in the Bhagavatam, we find they're absolutely huge. For example, the mountains just to the Earth's north are actually about eight times the height of the diameter of the Earth itself. So how do we understand that? Also again we see Jambudweep from slightly further away this time, with the little Earth there, amongst other realms. Um, compared with the, here, the, the size of Mount Smell of the Earth there, just on the right of the picture, you can see they are absolutely huge. For example here, um, some of the mountains have been 80,000 miles high, and even trees nearly 9,000 miles high. And various celestial realms with rivers, with mango juice, and the juice of the Jambu tree creates a river called Jambu Nadi. It flows through Lord Shiva's abode. So no way are we talking here about um, abodes on the earth. Rather, we're talking about the abodes of the gods connected to the earth. In terms of the scale, here's a banyan tree, and here's Lord Shiva. Remember the scales are given in the Bhagavatam. This makes Lord Shiva perhaps about the size of England. The third model now, as the earth plane in stereographic projection. First of all, we have to familiarise ourselves with an the ancient instrument called an astrolabe. This was used in ancient times, perhaps as far back as the Vedic times, for time and navigation, especially on the sea. This is important to understand here because the earth is represented as a base flat disk. Perhaps similar to this, this is uh, like an Earth in stereographic projection. In astrolabes, the Earth was represented in this flat planisphere like this. Of course, it's not that they all thought that the Earth was flat, as they d maybe did in medieval times. Rather, this is just a system of navigation. The planisphere model of the Earth corresponds with verses in the Bhagavatam which describe the hottest annual path of the Sun upon the Earth's surface. This is called the ecliptic. The planisphere model also fits the daily path of the sun in the middle of spring and autumn times. Of course, that's called the equinoxes. In this model, Jambudweep and its surrounding rings is essentially the Earth in stereographic projection. And it places Mount Smeru at the North Pole in this particular model. However, the features of Jambudweep and the Northern Hemisphere of today do not match this model. Although once the Earth was one huge island. According to continental drift theory, once all the landmass on the Earth was joined together as one single continent. Many stories of the Bhagavatam include Swayambhava of Manu. It's described that he was responsible for populating the universe, and that was over one and a half billion years ago. So we have to be open to the proposal that one meaning of a single island of Jambudweep describes the Earth as it once was, and here you can see the match between the stereographic projection of the single island of Earth and, of course, Jambudweep and its surrounding ocean on a flat plain. That brings us nice on to Chapter 20, Structure of the Local Universe, with Jambudweep as the centre of the solar system. Because it's not just the island and the surrounding flat plain of salt sea water we find ourselves, but there are other rings too. For example, rings of various heavenly lands and oceans are described. It's called the Plain of Bumandala. Let's look at the same thing from the top. And here you can see that you get to about the fourth or fifth ring out, and we get the orbit of the Sun. <coughs> Sadaputta Das goes into the detail of describing the similarities between Bumandala and the solar system, our solar system, that we're familiar with especially when looking at the distances, as described in Yojanas, and converting those to miles, we get quite a big link. Yet, the big difference between, of course, the Vedic worldview and the modern view is that in the Vedas, it is geocentric, whereas the Earth is conceived of being at the centre, not only of the solar system, but of the universe. 
But let's first of all try to understand this more by looking at relative motion. Here are two bodies, one much larger than the other, but the large one's also moving, so who's orbiting who? Surely that's a point of relativity. So Fred Hoyle, Victor says, the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only, and that such a difference has no physical significance. A modern example of relative planetary motion could be, for example, in modern astronomy they say, well, okay, the Earth, sorry, and the Sun, actually, the Sun revolves around the centre of the galaxy along with all the other stars. So the Sun is moving a lot. Given that, if the Sun is moving around the centre of the galaxy and the planets are moving around the Sun, as this diagram here shows, the planets are not actually mer moving in a circular motion, but rather, well, something quite different. So let's look into this heliocentric versus geocentric and how it can alter our model here. Heliocentric, of course, here is the Sun at the centre and here's the Earth and Mars orbiting the Sun and this, of course, is the standard theory. If we look here, at this, at this the geocentric model, the uh, Earth is at the centre and, of course, we have the perfectly round um, orbit there of the Sun but here we see Mars doing something different because, yes, it's trying to orbit the Sun but you can just see here there's an epicycle cycle and this is a, an epicycle here shown a bit more clearly. The planets are doing something a bit different, they're looping in their orbit from Earth's point of view. Here with the Earth at the centre, this is the geocentric orbit of Mercury. Add in the, the orbit of the Sun there and we start to get a pattern. Here is the geocentric orbit of Venus, Mars and all the inner planets here. Of course, at this point, it does get a bit of an eyeful. However, if we trace out here where the arrows are showing, the inner and outer orbits of the geocentric orbits of the planets here, we do get a lovely pattern, but actually, these distances match the description of Boumandela. And that's something quite remarkable, which proves that perhaps in ancient times, they knew the dimensions of the solar system from a geocentric point of view. Taking out here, right, as far as the orbit of Jupiter, geocentric orbit of Jupiter, and again we get dimensions that match. Taking out to the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, even the outer planet Uranus here is fairly close to what is described as the edge of the localized universe. So now, I invite you to go on to the second part of my presentation, Astronomy of the Bhagavad Purana, part two of three. See you there.